Hi, and welcome to Discover Energy Work. And I'm really excited this evening because I have somebody, well, number one, somebody that helped me a, a lot a few years ago. And he is Paul H. Smith, Dr. Paul H. Smith, who is a remote viewer who was part of the military unit in the United States, which did remote viewing using, using essentially psychic powers to... Um, know what the enemy was hiding, what they wanted to keep secret. And um, Paul, you, after that, I believe you um, then started the International Remote Viewing Association. You were one of the founding directors. Um, and for me, one thing that's really interesting, I mean, there's lots of things I'd like to talk to you about, um, is you, um, you, you did your PhD, uh, in philosophy, um, which was very much related, or, or as my wife said, unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I mean, it's really related to this whole area. But you know, discover energy work is kind of uh, trying to help people connect to um, to this area. You know, this sort of a little bit unquantified, uh, unquantifiable area. And I was watching you talking to Jeffrey Mishlove and. You were, as a kid, I understood, you did a project on psychic powers in school? Well, I was part of a science fair project in junior high school. A science uh, fair project. Which, so it wasn't your project? No, no. I was one of the subjects. So I, was, I was fascinated by ESP. It was, it was an extrasensory perception uh, right. project where um, they used the Zener cards, which is the, you know, the cards with the squiggly lines and the stars. The Dukes, and yeah, yeah, Duke University, yeah. There's total failure. <laughs> You're a total failure. Everybody in the project was a total failure. It came out with a null result. result. Okay. Uh, now, I, I know now that that wasn't the, the right way to go about it. But, but you know, that was back in the 60s. And, and people were playing around with these kinds of things. And, uh, right. and uh, there was a, we know a lot more today about how this works than we did back then. So. Right. So, so... I, I imagine like you became an intelligence officer, yeah? And then I can imagine your surprise, or I've, you know, I've, I've done my research, I've seen your surprise, yeah? Um, when you heard, oh, um, they want you to join this unit where mm -hmm. people are psychically, you know, going behind the enemy lines, as it were. Uh, and your book is called Reading the Enemy's Mind. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, number one, like, what was your first thought like, when, when they, they sort of came up to you and said, this is what we're doing? Well, so just a real quick little bit of background. So I'd always been interested in ESP. I used to uh, read all the science fiction books that had, that involved ESP kinds of things, Andre Norton's books and Zena Henderson's and all that. Mm -hmm. And I was really fascinated by it. Um, but when, uh, when the science fair project failed, I just kind of assumed that it was not, there wasn't really anything to it, you know? So, so when they're reading me onto this program and saying, we're, we collect intelligence against foreign threats using a uh, ESP based discipline called remote viewing. Uh, as this is unfolding, you know, over the maybe 10 or 15 seconds, uh, um, that it took him to explain it and then say, you don't have to decide right now. You can tell us in 24 hours. Right. Uh, my mind is going, I used to really be fascinated by this stuff. I thought it didn't work. Now they're telling me that Congress has actually levied money and they're training, training people how to do this. That must mean it really does work after all. There's no way I'm not going to do this. <laughs> you know? So, so I said, yes, uh, you know, right. And he said, well, you can wait till tomorrow. I said, no, uh, I'm signing up right now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, I, I think, uh, well, you got my thought process. I think they were surprised because I think he, the, it was Tom McNair was the guy's name who'd read me on. I think he had expected me to be, you know, kind of nonplussed, taken aback and really kind of dubious, you know, but no, I was on board, right. They had me right there, you know? So. Yeah. I, and, and I think nowadays we don't really uh, consider that it had to be top secret because you guys, I imagine uh, you'd be, targets i mean they want to you know the english they would bump you off you know they you're yeah. you are 
a, a spy satellite, you know, if you can shoot down a spy satellite, you know, you know. Or at least it. there's other things you can do for most of the other kinds of collection means, right? Uh, signals intelligence, you can scramble your, your, your communications or all kinds of stuff. But really the only defense against remote viewing is to take out the remote viewer. So that was one of the big motivations for it being so secret was they needed to protect their sources. So. Right. And, and essentially uh, the American government had done it in response to the fact that the Soviets at that time were spending like ridiculous money on yes. it as far as I understand. Yeah. You know, you know, people complain that, you know, the, the story is that uh, the U.S. government spent about $20 million on this program over 23 years. That's less than a million dollars a year, right? Now, for somebody who's, who's making $10 an hour, that sounds like an awful lot of money. But by, by military standards, it's actually trivial. The Russians were spending 10 times as much as that on their program. And, uh, and people who, you know, kind of belittle the government, well, they spent $20 million on this you know, a waste of time. Well, Russians wait then. If that's a waste, they wasted 10 times as much money as we did, you know, right, so. Right. Did you, and, um, and that's an estimate, obviously, so. Right, and, and did, I'm, I'm fascinated, uh, just as a matter of interest, like after the fall of the Iron Curtain and everything else, did you get any, any verification about those projects, what was actually going on in the psychic research? Well, it's, it's kind of trickled out over the years. Um, <clears throat> And I personally haven't got it myself, but there's been a couple of folks who were involved in the U.S. remote viewing program who, um, in a way, I want to say befriended the Russians, right? So, uh, because the Russians shut their program down and their people started talking about it. And, uh, okay. and so, uh, Ed May is one of them. Russell Targ had a little involvement in it, not so much anymore. Um, and Joe McMoneagle, those, those folks, um, those are folks who, um, were, you know, they, they wanted to find out a little bit more about what was going on on our, you know, their counterparts on the other side. And, and they've managed to get some very interesting information out. There's a book that Ed May published with some co-authors called um, ESP Wars East and West. And there's a whole section in there written by one of the primary folks involved in the Russian program. So, okay. you know, there's, there's information about it. it. There's still stuff that isn't clear about what exactly they were up to, but. Yeah, but there's a lot more than there used to be. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just fascinated. You know, we're in a, a time where, you know, a lot of the, and we still get this debunking of, you know, there's, you know, there's psychic powers. This is all, you know, nonsense. And, the, and then, you know, there are millions and millions of dollars being spent on it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been an enormous amount of uh, scientific evidence as well. Um, but uh, I, I kind of want to go back to your personal experience because you trained with Ingo, and I mean Ingo is a kind of I've read thing. I think every nearly everything is written. I just find it it's just incredible. I mean, um, how how was that training process? So, so you must have had a moment when you thought, "Whoa, something's something's going on here." Can you can you cast your mind back to that moment where you? Well, <clears throat> I think it was more of a gradual realization in a way, but, but, but there, there's a, a, perhaps a better way I can talk about this, and that is, so uh, when I first started training, uh, in fact, when I had my very first remote viewing session, um, I was fairly confident that there were other people were being able, are able to do it. The problem was I wasn't sure I could do it, right? Um, the, the the way they they got us they broke us in was essentially they put us in an environment where it, if we we're going to get anything useful at all it had we had to be psychic to do it right and uh, it's kind of the way it goes in this this field and in fact uh, it was successful but every other time I went to do it and even still today um, when I'm uh, on schedule to do a remote viewing session. I always have these doubts. Well, it worked before. I'm not sure it's going to work now. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you always have this kind of uh, concern or worry that maybe it's not going to click this time. Sometimes it doesn't, literally. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, an ability, a skill that uh, we actually don't know the causal connections to. We don't know how it works in the uh, general sense of cause and effect, right? So... 
<clears throat> we because of that there's times when it works and there's times when it doesn't and although sometimes we know why it doesn't work most of the time we don't um it just doesn't work doesn't click that day you know and so um there is plenty of evidence that it's real i mean there's there's a, a huge volume of well-attested science scientific evidence done under very strict scientific conditions uh, skeptics will deny that but in fact, uh, most of them have never either, either never examined the, the evidence or they have got this cognitive uh, dissonance thing where they can see it, but they don't recognize it. Uh, you know, they, they accuse uh, remote viewers and other psychics of being uh, having a confirmation bias, right? There is a skeptical confirmation bias that's any, just as strong as any psychic confirmation bias there is. Yeah. And we run into that. So... Um, yeah, you know, ultimately, uh, every time is almost the first time you do this because you don't know it's going to work. And, yeah. uh, and you take what you get. If you're successful, you take that as a, as a gift in a way. Right, right. I mean, I, I mean, I can confirm from my own experience, like, you know, every, every time I've done it, I've, I've thought, I, I, this can't be, Yeah. Um, and then yeah. I've had some um, moment of um, kind of feeling like I'm somewhere, yeah. And then that that moment um, again, it, it can't be. It's the whole thing. And then I all, I'm almost left frustrated, thinking, "No way, no way." Yeah. And then when I get the target, you know, I get because you know what some people don't realize is you you get when you're training, you get the target revealed to you with all the information about it. And you can well, see- Once you're done, we have to make sure yep. people understand that. It's after you're done that you get that revelation. Yeah. And, and the target is completely encoded. You, you've got a, you get, all you get is, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and a number of, essentially a number of ra random numbers. And, and that's your target. And then after you've done your process, once you're done and you've, you know, you've made your report, as it were. You you get the feedback, and mm -hmm. then you go, "Wow, I, I I know that bit of that target, yeah." yeah? And that's uh, that's a strange feeling, and uh, you know, you, you get a kind of high high from it, and and then sometimes you well, for me, I mean, sometimes it's just been it's been like I'd say time time spent um doing something i didn't really know what i was doing you know i just really hadn't been on the time well what i what i generally tell my students as i said uh, if you don't know whether you're on or not if you don't know whether you're getting the target or not that's actually a good sign <laughs> if you're if you are confident that what you're reporting is correct you're usually wrong about that uh, and of course that has to do with uh, the nuts and bolts of the whole process even though we don't know cause and effect in terms of how we get the information, we have some pretty good ideas about how it works once it gets into your head, right? And our, uh, our minds are notorious for generating their own noise, uh, trying to explain the experiences that, that uh, you're having in a remote viewing environment. And, um, and so, if you know, if you think you know what you're getting, it's usually your, your analytical processes in your mind that's generating a false picture uh, to try and explain everything uh, that, that you're experiencing. And it's almost always wrong. The more confident you are that you're getting the target, the more likely you are that you're off, that you're messing it up. And, and that for me is, you know, being interested in other kinds of psychic uh, work. Uh, I've done a lot of healing work and energy work. You tend to have the opposite. You tend to feel, no, I've got it. You know, I know what it's about. And and with um, CRV, yes, I can. Yeah, I mean, I have the same back, uh, same feedback. It's like, yeah, I've got no idea. I've got really no idea. And and uh, and then, of course, people are generally. Uh, I'm assuming, of course, most people know that you are working in a team of other people. So maybe more than one person was viewing the target and you, you'd essentially like a radar, you, everybody's got different takes yeah. on, the, on the same target. And then that intelligence comes together in a totally separate area. So 
you know, you guys sort of don't necessarily. Yeah, know. and and you can think of it kind of like a, essentially what they call the witness effect, right? Where um, several different people watch an accident, see an accident happen. Yeah. And when you interview them afterwards, none of their stories are exactly the same. You know, they all focused on different parts of it. They, they may have some uh, perceptual mistakes that they made because it happened quickly and all that and stuff. And so what you need to do is kind of, uh, if you're, say a police officer trying to figure out what, what actually happened is you take all the witness testimony and you, uh, you generally uh, weight heavier the stuff that they agree on as being most likely correct, you know, and go on from there. Um, the same thing, I mean, remote viewing is essentially a witness process. Uh, the more remote viewers you have on a certain project, and, and people need to realize you're, the remote viewers are working independently. They're not in the same room. They yeah. all get the same tasking, but they are working independently, just like they were a witness of, of a sort, right? And so um, you get the results in the end, or if we're talking about some practical operation, uh, you get the results in the end. And then you try and sort out, in addition to what other information is known, this is the standard kind of intelligence analysis process, uh, you get what other information is known, you compare it to what the remote viewers have uh, produced. And from there, you can come up with a reasonably accurate picture of what it is that you're trying to, trying to discern. So. Hmm. so if I go back in time with you, you've signed onto this project, you've been trained and then you've been in um, a unit with remote viewers, um, people like Lynn Buchanan, mm. Joe McMonagall, um, and uh, I'm trying to think of other names in uh, Mel Riley, I think. Um, Mel, Mel Riley, yeah. And, and of course, some of the more notorious ones like Ed Dames or right. Dave Morehouse, you know. That, and there was a large variety, a, a, a more, there were more people involved in the project that are known in public. So they're more not known by the public than are known by the public. Most of them just want to continue their private lives and they don't want to engage in the media circus that some of us, uh, <laughs> I guess, thrive yeah, on. I don't you're know. you're yeah, a little bit victim too. But um, yeah. so did you guys, I mean, it's a funny story because I'm just thinking, you know, you, you get a room with the, you know, the most psychic people in the world. And I know you probably you'd come in as the most unpsychic person in the world in your own mind. Yeah. Did you have any sort of strange experiences where you're like, wow, that's, that's kind of, I mean, not remote viewing, but something yeah. else that happened or you're you just know, kind of normal guys. Yeah. I'd have to think a while, but I, I would say that most of, any unique and not or unusual experiences happened in a remote viewing context. So we didn't have any weird things happen in the office. Well, <laughs> I'll to tell you some non-remote viewing stories here real quick. So one thing um, I used to, what we do, what we call cool down is you kind of get into a state of relaxation before the session. And for my cool down, I'd go over and lay on the bed over in the operations building. As I joke, uh, we were probably the only military organization in the world who had a bed as part of their operational equipment, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'd, I'd go over and I'd lay down and I'd put on my Walkman and uh, and I'd listen to heavy metal, ACDC. Well, what passed for heavy metal back then, ACDC, Black Sabbath, that kind of stuff, right? right. People say, cool down. That doesn't sound very cool down to me, <laughs> you know, but, but it worked for me, right? right. So uh, I'd be lay, laying on the bed early on in the program and my I kind of then – drift off, you know, for about 20 minutes, I'm going to drift off to sleep. And my arm would kind of drop down beside the bed. And every once in a while, I get this horrendous shock. Boo! And it would wake me right up. And I'd look around, where did that come from? I could never figure it out. And it happened probably over a couple of weeks. Every now and again, I get blasted by this, this shock. What the heck? I finally figured it out. Uh, our uh, Operation and Training Officer Skip Atwater had a little, uh, a very early generation uh, negative ion generator that he put down by the by uh, near the bed, and the, there was a baseboard heater from you know dated from the 1940s, right? The baseboard heater uh, right along that wall, and what it was doing is it was charging that metal heater thing, <laughs> and 
And so it would build up the static shock. And if you got close to it, it, there was one heck of a wallop out of that thing, you know. And uh, you didn't realize it because the ion generator was way down the wall. It wasn't, it wasn't that close to where you were at. So that, that was interesting. But one other thing, we played a joke on the fire marshal one time. So this is a military building. So the fire marshal, in spite of it being a highly classified place, the fire marshal, we were required to let him in periodically just to inspect the premises, right? And so we'd, we'd shut everything down, lock up all the safes, and we'd, we'd just be talking about, I don't know, sports or something when it came through so that no classified information got revealed inadvertently, right? Well, we had a dentist chair in the back office. And uh, the dentist chair, somebody thought, well, you know, as long as the dentist is not working on you, a dental chair can be adjusted just right so you're very comfortable. So maybe that would be a good way of doing remote viewing, getting yourself in a really state of comfort in a dental chair, right? right. Well, we never really explored it because, uh, I don't know, I guess people prefer the bed. I don't know. But uh, one time they thought, we're going to get the fire marshal. So they, um, they got a bed sheet and covered up the dental chair with it. And then they got a car battery and some jumper cables and put them down next to the the thing and of course the rumor all over post was well they're doing kind of some kind of really weird secret stuff in those buildings and he mm. came in there and it looked like a, a setup for a torture scene right <laughs> 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 and he, he went out of there absolutely convinced that we were hooking people up to electrodes and shocking the snot out of them so that they would reveal their <laughs> secrets you know <laughs> so yeah none of that has to do with remote viewing but uh no, but it's... folks did have a sense of humor you know yeah. we, we did have a great time uh, in those circumstances um but yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the stra high strangeness stuff uh, happened uh, in conjunction with remote viewing sessions for the most part. And we did do some very interesting and odd things uh, for targets. So Right. And, and some of it, like you can't talk about. I mean, obviously, and obviously that's nothing we want to talk about. But um, can you like give people an idea of some target that you... Um, were able to get feedback on that you did. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so they got yeah. an idea. Yeah, it's surprising actually how much is not classified anymore. Um, the, of course, the one everybody talks about is the, uh, the Joe McMonigal, arguably the best remote viewer in the military program uh, over the years of it. Uh, Joe McMonigal and another early Stargate remote viewer named Hartley Trent uh, they were tasked to describe the interior of a huge building up on the White Sea in the Soviet Union and proceeded to describe this submarine, which, uh, as Joe described it, was immense. It was bigger than anything any submarine ever built. Uh, it strangely had the missile tubes in front of the, the sail, the, the superstructure on the sub. Uh, most subs don't have it. They most, in fact, almost all of them otherwise have them behind the superstructure for various reasons. And and uh, he, he described all kinds of things. And the the tasking came from the National Security Council, and they essentially rejected this thing as science fiction. That's just crazy. That remote viewer didn't know what he's talking about. But mm. uh, about ten months after he did provide, they Hartley and Joe just provided the description. The Soviets actually floated out the Typhoon submarine, which was the largest submarine uh, ever built, still is. Missile tubes in front of the superstructure, exactly as Joe described. Um, and this was all done, and it came, it was, it was, it was essentially a strategic surprise to the United States. And I know that. I wasn't in the remote viewing program at the time. But uh, uh, when that happened, I was actually the, uh, one of the intelligence officers for a special forces unit in Germany. And they, their, their tasking was all of Western Europe, or all of Eastern and Western Europe. And, and so we got all the intel briefs in, uh, the top secret compartmented intel briefs yeah. um, for Europe. And we got the one that reported for the first time the Typhoon submarine. And... You know, an intelligence uh, analysis report is generally pretty tedious and boring, but this one, you could read the fear in it <laughs> between the lines. They said, look what the Russians have done, <laughs> you yeah. know, because yeah. it really upset the balance of power. That, that Typhoon submarine was a massive game changer during the Cold War, and we didn't really know about it. Uh, and Joe McMinigal described this thing 
10 months before it ever happened. And, and you know, definitely, obviously we got feedback on it. And, and we didn't know about it because it was, it was built where you couldn't see it, wasn't it? It was actually in yeah. a structure where you, like that you wouldn't even guess that somebody built a submarine there. There's, there's no way, was no way to, to see inside. This building is, um, so it was, it was long enough that you could put a one and a half U.S. fleet size aircraft carriers in it wow. end to end. And, uh, and that's massive. I mean, a carrier is uh, 1,000 to 1,200 feet long. And this, you could have put one and a half of them in there. It wow. tells you how big that building was. It was immense. And right. uh, when they first set it up, actually, the building was something like half a kilometer from the ocean. So uh, how many yards that works out to? Uh, I want to say 400, but I could be wrong. But, but a yeah, significant difference. Yards, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a significant distance, and it was all dirt. There was not a channel there. So that's why everybody's puzzled. You know, what is this? And then he dug up the channel eventually and floated, floated the sub out. So, um, yeah, that was one, uh, you know, it, because they didn't believe him, it had no policy effect. But, uh, but it, we were able to get verification on it. He was absolutely right. You know, absolutely described it 10 months before anybody knew about it. Incredible. So, yeah. And um, do you feel, because I've noticed that um, one of the things you teach, I mean, you're teaching remote viewing um, as you learn. I, I, I can, can I say, as you learned it from Ingo with the, yeah, I mean, some as close as, yeah. yeah, as close as I can. Um, and of course there's, there's like a thousand and one flavors of, of remote viewing out there. 90% uh, of them descended from the Ingo Swan methodology. Yeah. controlled remote viewing methodology. Um, but, uh, you know, I have tried to keep it as close as possible. I'm the only one uh, actually active today teaching this methodology that was trained by Ingo Swan. So, you know, right. I don't want to maintain the purity. Now, you would imagine that, uh, let's see, uh, I learned it in 84. What's that? That's almost the, what, that's 35 years ago or something like that, 36, yeah. somewhere in there. Uh, you can imagine that we've learned stuff since then, right? So there are some things that I uh, have had to uh, confront and, and change in the program, in, in the methodology. Um, but I'm very upfront about what those things are so people know that this is not what Ingo taught. Um, but I don't change anything unless I have really good uh, substantiation for it. Uh, so for example, um, in remote in Ingo Swan's version uh, of CRV, um, he believed at the time that the autonomic nervous system was involved in some of the processing that happens. Right. Well, we we know now that that isn't true. I mean, the autonomic nervous system isn't even hooked up to those particular processes. So I've had to acknowledge Ingo had got that part wrong. Right. Um, but anytime I teach the class, I make sure people know that this is how it was. And the best evidence we have now says this is how we have to do it. Right. Um, most of the other methodologies out there don't let you know that. They, they make you, when they make you think, they allow you to think that this is the way it always was, right? But, but that's not the case. And, and I, I, I'm really big on full disclosure and, uh, and full acknowledgement. Hmm. Uh, that's well, that's nice. I think you need that to, in order to uh, to be successful. So, right. And do you feel? I mean, now I have to say, like this is over 30, 30 something years since yeah. you learned it. Do you feel you're more psychic now? Well, <laughs> that actually goes into a philosophical discussion, uh, okay. and I'll explain why. Wow. It's because I don't think anybody is ever more or less psychic than they ever were. Um, I think, and in fact, the, uh, the research done by the scientific side of the process, which was done at Stanford Research Institute, which we now call SRI International, that's now its new name, but, right. but used to be owned by Stanford University, Stanford Research Institute. The folks that did the actual basic research there, which is the umbrella that, that Ingo Swan was working under when he trained us, yeah, um, those folks pretty much uniformly uh, are convinced that everybody can do this, that everybody is psychic. So, you know, essentially to use that term 
uh, just broadly. Everybody can do it. <clears throat> the, what gets in people's way is, first of all, their belief in their own abilities, and second of all, their ability to be open-minded and let go of false notions and embrace new ones mm -hmm. that are more, uh, more effective, right? So I'll often get students who've learned how to be psychic in a certain way, and the ones who have the hardest time are those who have learned a different system and just can't let go of the parts of it that don't actually work very well. Um, and as you can imagine, just like anything else in life, some systems are more effective than others. But there are thousands of different ways of being psychic out there that, that different people introduce and they come in with uh, different biases and ideas and notions and stuff. And so you'll never expect uh, all, all approaches to work as well as any other approach. They, it, they just don't, just like anything else in the world. Some approaches are more effective than others. And if you can't learn to let go of the stuff that doesn't work and embrace the stuff that does work, uh, no matter how psychic you could be, no matter how psychic, how much psychic ability you have underlying it all, you're not going to be able to realize it if you aren't applying correct principles, essentially. So, sorry, that's a soapbox for me. That's, well, it's interesting, but now I'm going to go back to the, 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 like the man in the street who's saying, since you've learned it, do you feel more connected with that part, which is able to you know, know certain things or, or? Yeah, so in one respect, it's kind of hard for me to answer the question anyway, because over time, I've kind of forgotten what it was like not to be able to remote true, view, right? True, so, there is a bias, so isn't there? That's tough, yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, one thing that I can acknowledge is that I have become much more in touch with my underlying intuition. Um, so remote viewing is actually something you turn in, on and off. You're presented with a specific task, you do the remote viewing, you end the session and you're done remote viewing. You aren't, you aren't a remote viewer 100% of the time. It's very much controlled, yeah. hence the name, controlled remote viewing, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, what I found is that learning remote viewing and becoming proficient at it and, and establishing long-term remote viewing kind of habits as kind of, uh, it's kind of activated my attention. Uh, I, I don't want to say it's activated my intuition because I think all of our intuitions, uh, all, all of us, we have an underlying intuition that's always alerting us to things. Yes. But what we haven't learned is how to pay attention to it. Right? Yeah. And having become a, a long experienced remote viewer, I find that I am paying a lot more. Uh, so in other words, I'm getting more information from my intuition, more alerts, more guidance and all that, um, because I'm paying attention to it. I'm letting that information emerge. I'd say that's probably one of the big benefits, at least in everyday life. Now, I don't mm. use remote viewing in my everyday life, particularly to solve problems, mm. uh, because there are oftentimes more efficient ways of solving those problems. Um, right. but, uh, but definitely the, and one of the big advantages in everyday life is that it's, enhance my intuition now whether it's enhancing the intuition or enhancing my ability to respond to it which is i think what it really is that has been uh, massive yeah right i mean it's definitely uh i think i think it's been described so many times as a signal i think uh, russell targ talks a signal noise problem and so yes. you're able right. to listen to the signal more and say mm -hmm. this is signal and that's noise mm -hmm. so i'm gonna listen and that that's that's really cool um, and and I'm I'm kind of curious also by, about the dowsing. I saw that you mm -hmm. you do dowsing, and do you consider that part of the remote viewing? Yeah, I describe them as the inverse of each other, right? So you think of it this way: in remote viewing, you know where something is, you don't know what it is, right? And this is very simplistic because there's things you could say about that. But generally, right. you know where something is, you don't know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. In dowsing you know what it is, but you don't know where it is, right? So they're like these um, inverse complementary kind of relationship between right. the two. Um, <clears throat> but I think ultimately they both uh, rely on the same underlying capacity that we, uh, we humans have for applying our consciousness, you know, in a, in a, as we say, non-local way, right? I think that they're both, uh, they're just different tools in that particular uh 
ability, I guess, right. that we have. Right. Oh, fascinating. Now, how could I, what would be your advice to somebody who wanted to approach this area was just curious? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, I, I'm sort of asking as well to say, like, there are pitfalls, you know, definite pitfalls where somebody says, oh, yeah, I, I know remote viewing, you know, and uh, um, we, we all know uh, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is yes. people that really don't know very much at all have enormous confidence in their abilities and people that know a great deal are a little bit more conservative. Um, yeah. So um, what would your advice be? Well, um, the first thing is to be aware of that there is a huge amount of noise out there in the remote viewing community. There are all kinds of people of all different levels of knowledge and experience with all kinds of a priori biases working in their, in their minds uh, who claim that they're remote viewing experts. Um, one of the biggest things that I think is a problem um, is that a lot of folks want to use remote viewing for esoteric kinds of things like UFOs and Bigfoot and all that. And, and I, I'm not going to say that you should not use it for that, but if you're going to learn remote viewing, that's not going to help you. Uh, you need, you need right. to do remote viewing on things that, that are verifiable in order yeah. to learn whether you're doing it right or not. So the first thing is don't believe every story you hear out there. Most of them aren't true. Uh, and the ones that are, are often exaggerated, even from people who were in the program, you'll hear a lot of uh, contradictory things and also exaggerated sensational things from people who are actually in, even in the military remote viewing program. Right. Uh, ego is a big part of this field, a huge amount. Uh, people have their egos that they want to feed and uh, mm. it can get in the way of both truth and progress uh, in, in remote viewing. So that's the first thing is a warning, right? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm promoting Self being self-promoting, but I am, right? Um, Absolutely. But, yeah, but <clears throat> um, I've got, of course, a very comprehensive program to, to bring people into remote viewing. And it starts off free, and it goes to less expensive, and then it gets to moderately expensive, and then it gets to very expensive if you want the fully leaded product, right? Mm -hmm. So the free stuff is, um, I've got a couple of videos online, one called Remote Viewing Martial Art for the Mind on YouTube. Okay. And uh, that one is just a 15 minute overview of what remote viewing really is, giving you some background, a tiny amount of history, but it's mostly just background of, of what remote viewing is and how it may have been used, um, that kind of thing. And then a companion video I've got out there is called um, How to Do a Simple Remote Viewing. Okay, uh, and essentially it's a 10 minute uh, description of how you can do remote viewing yourself at a very kind of fundamental level, just get a taste for it. Um, and a lot of people found that very useful as an entree into remote viewing that doesn't take a lot of time and doesn't take very many resources at all. Um, and so those two things are, are they're, they're portals into the, uh, into the remote viewing world that I think will get you off on the right foot so that when you do get uh, loaded, uh, you know, all this stuff loaded on you, all of the fantasy and the sensationalism, the kind of, at least you'll have a, a, a grounding point. Um, I also recommend my book, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing. Uh, right. I did not write that book to get rich. I can guarantee you I'm not getting rich with that book. Um, <laughs> but I realized uh, after I'd written my first book, um, and a while after I'd written my first book, that there was this gap in the remote viewing literature. And it was for people who are just getting started. There were no books for beginners. Um, and so I wrote this book with three audiences in mind. Um, the first one is people who just found out about remote viewing, uh, don't really know anything about it. And it's a sort of a survey, no nonsense. I don't get in any of the, the bizarre things. You know, I don't talk about UFOs and remote viewing, that kind of stuff. Right. You can get that later, right? Uh, uh, the book is just, it, it talks about how remote viewing works, what we know about how it works, how it's used, uh, some of the history. Again, not a big focus on history, but you need to have that context. Uh, I have a whole chapter. Uh, well, I have three chapters on evidence that it's real. And, and one of those chapters is also uh, 
addresses the skeptical arguments. It talks about, you know, tells you why the skeptical arguments aren't legitimate. Uh, although I also take the test, the true believers, the ones who want to want to throw a bunch of stuff into this, they'll believe anything, you know, right, right before what, 15 things before lunch or whatever it is. <laughs> so right. impossible things, that's it. But, uh, but that book, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing, is designed for people who are getting started. Also, for people who are in remote viewing and they have friends or relatives that are dubious about it, and they want to, and these people want a way to introduce their friends and relatives in a safe way to remote viewing. So, um, yeah, you know, both of those uh, those demographics will find that book useful. And then I can go on from there. I won't go into detail about my courses, but I do live in-person courses. Uh, they're quite expensive, I have to tell you, because. I limit my student set to two students per instructor. It's very intense, very thorough, goes on for several days. Right. Um, and you can do that. Well, there's an intermediary thing too. I also offer a DVD based home study program called uh, uh, Remote Perception. It's not called Remote Viewing, it's called Remote okay. Perception. Um, so that that's the whole, how I would tell people to get into it. Now, you know, there's obviously other good books out there that I didn't write. Uh, Mind Reach by Put Off and Targ is a great one. People ought to, for you know, to explain how this all started, you know, the mm. science behind it and all that. And there, there's others too. Yeah. Uh, I've probably been going on too long about this. Sorry. I, yeah. No, I mean, um, you know, I, I'd love for people to get in, get, get in touch with good information and good teachers. I mean, that just, that's just great. Um, and I'd like people, um, I mean, the, the I, I personally, you know, every book that Ingo wrote pretty much is, mm -hmm. is very well researched. Um, I mean, there's, there's a couple which, I mean, you might, might say penetration is, yeah. uh, well, that's <laughs> a special, Interesting very material, special, yeah. that's a very special book, but, yeah. um, uh, you know, um, his book on the apparitions of Mary or, mm -hmm. uh, the Nostradamus book. I mean, they're just incredibly well researched. Um, and they can I'm glad you say that about the Mary book because I helped him on that. Uh, yeah. I did. I did some German translations for him. He uh, he had got some sources for the Mary book that were in German, and uh, he needed. To, and since I do German, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Me too. Um, but um, so what I did was, um, funnily enough, I it's one of the few books that I gifted somebody. Mm -hmm. Because I thought it was such an amazing book, yeah. you know how people uh, discount these these apparitions of Mary, mm -hmm. and then if somebody actually goes back and does the research and says, "Okay, so there is actually this happens quite a lot," and and by the way, yes, most of the time they are discounted, but we've done the research, and here's the research: you make your own. You can you've got the information; you can make your own mm -hmm. decision whether it's true yeah. or not. And you could tell how well he'd researched it. It was just amazing. So I'm, I'm a big, um, sadly, you know, um, after his death, uh, I never got to, to meet him, but I'm a big Ingo uh, Swan fan for mm -hmm. the incredibly detailed um, nuance work that he did. And his uh, book, um, I think it's called Natural ESP. Oh, uh, Natural ESP. Yeah, one. There's actually book. two versions of it, and I'm blanking on what the Everybody's Guide to ESP is one, and then Natural ESP is the other. They're kind of the same book, but one's a newer version of the other. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was writing my when I was writing my um, paper, my senior project uh, for mm -hmm. my psychology degree. I couldn't get hold of it, so I wrote to Bantam, and I asked them to publish it on Kindle, and a few months later, it was published on Kindle. So I always say to people, like, if there's a book you want and you know it's been published, and I saw it being sold on uh, Amazon for like $300. You know, oh, it's for for original, yeah. Yeah, the originals. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, a few weeks later, uh, literally weeks later, it was uh, published. And I'd been given a photocopy, which totally, totally, you know, and I said, well, I'm buying the original. Like, I never, ever wanted to do it like this, but I... Um, hey, yeah. hey, you're in Asia. That's perfectly acceptable, right? <laughs> no, I, well, I won't, I won't uh, comment on that, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, so after, after leaving, I mean, I would like to just kind of, what's your raison d'etre? After leaving the project, I mean, it's an incredible thing 
for you to then devote your life really to this area i mean it, it says a lot about how much it's meant to you um but i mean how how did you do that i mean well it was interesting um i retired from the army in 96 um and frankly i wanted my wife wanted me to get a government job <laughs> Right. And, and okay. I did apply for an intelligence analyst position at, at National Security Agency, bought the suit, suit, did the polygraph, all of that stuff. Right, you know? right. and, and I didn't get accepted. And I was so relieved. I did not want to do another job like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so two things happened at that point. First of all, I decided to start my own remote viewing training company because that's that's really the most of what uh, I was equipped to do in the remote viewing world at the time, right? Mm. Um, because it was really just getting started. I mean, it was uh, November of 95 uh, on a Nightline program where remote viewing, where the fact that we had a remote viewing program was revealed to the public for the first time. It was massive. You know, the publicity was amazing. Um, and, uh, and some of my colleagues had, soon after that started their own companies actually one had started his back in 1989 uh which was under the radar and uh, i think that the government security managers would have been pretty upset about it in fact they did become upset later on mm. uh, but uh but you know then th this opportunity presented itself so i told my wife you know what i think i'm going to open an, a, a remote viewing training company and she goes you're gonna do what <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're going to starve. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, that was the first thing. And the other thing was that instead of going to work, I uh, enrolled in college. Um, I, you know, I had for a long time wanted to get a PhD. And over the last few years in the army, I realized what I wanted to do is get into the discipline that was as close to figuring out what the bottom line was in the universe. Uh, and some people might have said physics, that's not true. Actually, it's philosophy. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is the one that wrestles with all the existential questions, yeah, right? It's going to say discard. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, plus it also was very nice uh, adjunct to the whole remote viewing thing that I was ultimately making a career of. Right. So, um, so I studied philosophy of mind, uh, consciousness, philosophy of parapsychology, which I sort of uh, I had to invent that program as I went along because it's not an actual discipline in the in the uh, academic world. It isn't philosophy. Actually, philosophy does embody philosophy of parapsychology, but it's just not something that you get at, at the University of Texas at Austin, right? Right. So, right. Uh, you know, and philosophy of science. So I want to follow all those things. So I got these two tangents going on that weren't actually tangents. Uh, I got into uh, academia and uh, had to take some undergraduate uh, do two semesters undergraduate just to get some philosophical background because I hadn't had any in my regular college and then also have my company working on the site and start you know my company's remote viewing instructional services right, right. Uh, in fact I probably ought to mention my URL which is rviewer.com so r-v-i-e-w-e-r.com I'll so, put it in um, the show notes yeah oh thank you I appreciate it so um so I also was one of the main uh, actors in creating the International Remote Viewing Association, which was a, a uh, is still is a nonprofit organization, international, as the title says, uh, that focuses on on uh, promoting developing remote viewing. So I'm doing all of these things at once, and that's how I live my life, and it f freaks my wife out because she does things one thing at a time usually. <laughs> so, right, right. so anyway. And now I can't remember what the question was. I started well, giving that. The question is, is like, what what would make you do that? Because I mean, it, it's oh, gotcha, it's, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a an incredible. Um, I say, like somebody with with your knowledge, your background, you could do anything and earn a lot of money from it. I, I would yeah. say you had a lot in of. In fact, the army wanted me back. You know, starting right. with nine eleven, uh, I actually got calls and. Hey, you're a Middle East, Mid East specialist. Exactly, uh, Arabic. Army officer, that. security clearances. Mm. How would you like to come back on board? Right. <laughs> right? right. And I would have made a lot more money. Uh, to Absolutely. be honest, I would have made a lot more money 
yeah. working for the government than I have uh, on retired pay and, and doing the remote viewing stuff. But it wasn't about money. It's the fact is, uh, there's a huge war going on in our society. People don't realize it, but it's there. And it's between the people who think everything is physical. And, and if you think about that, ultimately that has repercussions in every aspect of life. If the universe is only physical, then all kinds of things would change in the way we do things. Uh, so there are those who think everything is physical and that's where mainstream science is right now. That's its, its major dogma. And it is a dogma, by the way. It's not, yeah. it's not an actual scientifically founded fact, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is physical versus those of us who, so what pushed me over is because I had experiences in the remote viewing program, which are totally undeniable and which can be totally confirmed that the universe isn't only physical, right? And Give there's a whole one. story behind Tell that. Tell me one. I'm, well, you, I mean, the fact me. if you can if you could sit in Fort Meade, Maryland, in a closed room, and remote view a Chinese nuclear uh, test over in I don't know wherever the Chinese do nuclear tests, right? right. Uh, without being aware of what the what the target is and re, and being able to present information that could only have been gotten by the fact that you your consciousness was able to detect that. Right. in real time on the other side of the planet, there is nothing in the world of physics that can account for that. Nothing. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I could give you like scores of examples, right? Yes. But it, it would only be limited by my, by what I could remember at the given time. Right. Yeah. And I, of course I have a lot of stuff documented in, in the archives of the CIA declassified and all that. Right. So, um, so I have absolutely no doubt that the universe is actually is involves two aspects, uh, at least consciousness and the physical domain, and they are not the same thing. Right. They're not the same thing. So in a way, it's, it's kind of a. I know the word crusade has a bad connotation today, but but it's yeah. a good descriptor, right, for what mm. how I feel about this. That was crusade uh, to. Uh, help the world differentiate that it isn't all just physical there's more to it because it has huge implications for where we go as a human race mm. is recognizing that it isn't all physical that there is this non-local element to the universe and so I, I guess that's probably my biggest motivator yeah it's nice to make money in fact i have to make money to some degree with this uh, even if i didn't need money i would still charge because people don't appreciate stuff they don't pay for right right yeah. Um, but I, I'm not in the position where I don't need money. <laughs> right, so, right. so, but I do, um, I do that for the other purpose, right? That provides me the resources uh, I need to allow me to do this evangelical crusade, right? To, to, uh, to help the world understand. I mean, I've given tons of talks at conferences that, that outline this, this dichotomy that we have in the world and, and why I think it's a mistake. To right, and and it's a, I'm fair in saying, um, not exactly the the title of your PhD, but it uh, was about physicalism yeah. versus, you know, whether that's really um, the best way of looking at the world, or is it even valid to 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 use that? I mean, I yeah. uh, I. I was looking at it uh, this evening, and of course, you know, I used it in um, um, in part. I mean, was I really wasn't in the greatest state of mind when I was writing my senior project, but I did. I did. Uh, Are we ever <laughs> uh, use it? And um, uh, I mean, I think I, I wonder. I feel it's to, to, to me, it's almost a bit altruistic because, like, you, do you know what I mean? It's it's an altruistic thing that we're doing for the greater good um mm -hmm. and it's yeah it's sort of putting putting yourself out there but what i find fascinating i just just imagining before you know that um I, when i discovered you know in 1989 i i met a taoist master and, and when i discovered energy and he was holding up his hand and literally dowsing the body for sicknesses with his hand and saying that's a sickness and i can i recognize how Mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. sickness that is because i recognize how it feels mm -hmm. um that i i felt this was a great secret 
and that nobody knew. And I, I really didn't know how, how to deal with it myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're an intelligence officer. So it's, I imagine a lot of your life has been about dealing with secrets and then this, do you know what I'm saying? And then, whereas for me, it was almost a stigma to come out with something that was a secret, but I imagine as an intelligence officer, it's a little bit different. Um, One thing I, I have come to really understand is that some things have to be secret. Right. I, I agree. You have this mo- move in today's world to make nothing secret, to make everything open and available. Mm. Um, there are, th- I mean, the, the, the classical thing is how to build a hydrogen bomb, right? That has to be secret, right? Right. Uh, because uh, ultimately you don't know who would get, who if that technology was open, who would get it and, and, mm. and to the detriment of everyone, right? So, uh, but there are lots of other things that remain secret. And in fact, people who think the government ought to reveal all its secrets, foolishly, in my opinion, mm. uh, don't realize how many secrets they themselves deal in. I don't think that human society could function um, if there weren't things that were secret. Uh, I mean, we keep things secret within our families. We keep secret things secret from our spouses, sometimes not for good reasons, right? If you're having an affair, you keep that secret. That's not mm. a good reason. Mm. But sometimes there is good reasons. Like uh, if your wife is you know, feeling really insecure about something, you don't want to come out and, and say all the things that might be true, but are going to undermine her security even further. Right. I mean, that's just not right, right? So you keep some, those kinds of things secret. Um, you one of the biggest problems we have today is people can't seem to keep gossip secret. You know, they know some dirt on somebody and they just feel absolutely required to blab it. And that doesn't hurt. That doesn't help anybody. All it is is kind of a sensational self gratification kind of a thing. Uh, There are many things that we might know about other people that we should be keeping secret in the interest of not hurting them unnecessarily and hurting others necessarily. Mm. Uh, So, so, being having secrets is part of being human. Uh, obviously, you can keep things secret to the detriment of people, but there are times when you keep things secret, secret to their benefit. And uh, and the trick is knowing the difference and having the discipline to to keep the right secret secret and not protect the wrong secrets. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's a bit like consciousness. You know, there's some things. Um... Um, whereas if we were to experience something traumatic and, and this, you know, this is a topic in remote viewing that if you went and, and you weren't trained to go to the, to a crime scene, or Mm -hmm. if your target was Belson concentration camp in the, at the height of the Holocaust, Mm -hmm. your consciousness, it's, it's actually, it's not a secret. It's, you know, but it's, uh, your consciousness couldn't deal with it. So it will be mm-hmm. damaging to you and to a certain, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. um, potentially. Um, and um, there's, there's something there. There's something linked there. I, and I'm not sh- quite sure how to, um, how to, uh, but there's an irony that what you're doing is essentially is a tool that can just go straight to the heart of secrets, really. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Now some people think remote viewing is a miracle worker kind of a deal, you know, where every secret is available, you know, it's not that precise. No, It has its own weaknesses and, and, and drawbacks. So, exactly. so fortunately in some respects, fortunately it's not able to get to the bottom of every secret that there is. Um, But, uh, but it can, it can do that at least to some extent. And that's what people have to understand. We did succeed in the military program in revealing secrets that needed to be revealed. Right. Uh, our part in the war on drugs, uh, we were we were tasked to try and find uh, contraband stashes and uh, and drug traffickers and stuff, and we were successful many times. Right. And so those are the kind of secrets that need to be revealed, right? Right. Um, so one thing to say though is not everything that that your remote view is secret; it just might be hidden, right? Uh, right. And people say, "What? What? I don't get that." Well, for example. Uh, if you're trying to find out something that happened in the past, uh, that that thing in the past may not be secret, but because it's in the past, to normal senses, it's hidden, right? So being hidden and being secret can oftentimes be two different things. 
Um, and so oftentimes remote viewing, if, I think if you think about it in terms of not finding out secrets, but finding out hidden things, right. uh, that might be a better way of thinking about remote viewing in terms of what it does, right? What its purpose is. You know, Paul, I can, what's coming up in my, me uh, right now is um, what probably a lot of people who are listening and they don't realize that um, psychic functioning um, you know, and remote viewing uh, as, you know, a tool of that, uh, you can travel through time. You can travel forwards, backwards. You know, in an interesting uh, sense, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, it's, and there are time paradoxes, and, and it's, uh, but it's, I, I feel like, well, that's kind of maybe a uh, subject for a, another day. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what I've got now, I feel like uh, I've got something where people can understand um, a little bit, a bit about what is remote viewing, the, um, a little bit about how they could uh, approach it and, mm -hmm. um, and some interesting, interesting aspects. I feel it's, I feel, you know, what I really want to do is I want to give people personal stories because mm -hmm. a story says so much, you know, when somebody says, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in a military unit and there's a guy telling me, yeah, we do this psychic stuff. Do you want to learn it? And I mean, that's an incredible story uh, in itself. And that just hearing that might open somebody's mind to, well, that's, that's cool. Um, are you working with any um, um, uh, police agencies? Is that something that you do? Um, I have have done in the past. I'm not currently working with any, um, well, at least directly. I mean, uh, generally speaking, I'm not doing a lot of operational work right now anyway. I'm focusing more on my training, or at least once the pandemic is over, I'll be focusing on my training. Right. Um, my philosophy, and I just actually wrote up something on Facebook about this in a discussion. Uh, my philosophy now is uh, I, I should be done with fishing, right? I need to teach other people to do fishing because I'm now a senior citizen. I don't have that much longer to, to left to work. Right. And at the point where I can't do remote viewing anymore, I really, really, really want people still here who know how to do it correctly right. uh, to be able to do that even once I'm off the, you know, not in the picture anymore. Right. Um, so, so it's like, um, you might say it's like a, um, you're moving into the generative uh, position where it's now I hand this down to the next generation as an elder. Yeah. In a way, of course, that's been part of what I've been doing all along, but, right. but that's where I, I, in the last year or so, that's where I'm placing my focus uh, is more on creating new remote viewers than just doing remote viewing for people. But I still do stuff now and again. Uh, I've, I've uh, done work with, uh, uh, well, Iris in English. It's a French company uh, run by a guy named Alexis Champion, who, uh, who does, is really successful. It's probably one of the most successful, well, it might be the most successful commercial remote viewing operations hmm. in history since the government closed it down, right? Um, and I do stuff working with the Husik group who, uh, Gail Husik runs that and she has a whole stable of remote viewers that she works on uh, practical operational problems. Mm, okay. uh, and that I'll do some work with that, but mostly I think uh, training is my most important contribution here. So, mm, Great. Well, thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate it. It's, it's morning now. Where actually are you? You're in Texas, are you? I uh, used to be in Texas. Uh, I'm in southern Utah now, up in the mountains. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous here. I mean, I spent 17 years in Austin, Texas, which is a wonderful place. But having lived here in Cedar City, I'll never move back, never move back. It's just, it's just perfect here. <laughs> We're right in the middle. I mean, I'm, I'm a half a day's drive or less from seven major national parks. Wow. Uh, including Zion and Bryce and the Grand Canyon. And I mean, you can't be better situated for gorgeous scenery than, than right here where I am. Beautiful. So I love it. Oh, I'm, I'm actually just, I think I'm just um, not exactly remote viewing. My mind's just gone to those beautiful uh, places. So that, that's a lovely feeling. Um, I would like to talk to you again. I really enjoyed it. Um, I feel like it, it can really benefit so many people. Um, and, and I really hope it does. So thank you very, very much.
Oh, you're welcome. This is a great interview. I've been able to say things that I haven't said before because you asked the right questions. I much appreciate it.